Go ahead. Just fucking hit record. All right, I'm I'm hitting record. Oh. Three, two, one. Uh, hey, everybody. <laughs> this is the inaugural episode <laughs> of the Doddlers Philosophy <sighs> Podcast being recorded, but simultaneously live streamed. Because we are so good and at everything. We need to give ourselves more cognitive load. <laughs> Excitement. This is actually really all to help my allergic sinusitis. The doctor said, if you live stream simultaneously on YouTube, Twitch, and what else? <laughs> Periscope. Does anybody use that? <laughs> on Periscope, my mother does. You can, uh, you can clear up all the sinus. It's amazing. So I was like, "All right, enough of this hocus pocus with the medicine. Let's live stream to get this allergic sinusitis in check." All um, right, begin. We'll, we'll find out later if we're <laughs> even there. You know, we we'll just click the button for now, and then we're going to sure will. And then we'll see it may exist, and if it exists, then we'll we'll be there. So yeah. Follow us on YouTube and Twitch and Twitter. And then you can, and someday maybe we'll have, you know, like interactive chat sessions and everything. This is going to be crazy. We're expanding. Brian doesn't it's care. It's a revolution. He wants to talk and... about Thomas Nagel's 1974 article in the Philosophical Review entitled... What is it like to be a bat? Question mark. Yes, I want to talk about this. Yeah. So, but I want Harlan to lead us in prayer. Periodically, I figure there's been too much time spent on the Doddler's Philosophy podcast with sympathy. There's too many, hey, here's a cool idea. Hey, I like this person. Hey, you should read this book. And it's time to bring around another takedown. It's been too long. So, I thought we'd attempt to talk about what it's like to be a bat because it is an extremely influential essay that once you visit its Wikipedia, it will say this was the founding document of 40 years of confusion in the philosophy of mind literature this is it's seminal work they say and then i read it and i'm like i i, mm. I don't see it so it's uh, <laughs> it's supposed to be a big deal that's why we're going to talk about it and what does he say very first sentence sounds like a fair restatement of the thesis consciousness is what makes the mind-body problem really intractable. So he's going to be arguing, quote-unquote, that conscious experience is a widespread phenomenon that occurs at many levels of animal life. If you notice anywhere in here where he does argue that, I'm curious to hear it. I feel like this is a master class in begging the question and confusing definitional statements with argumentative conclusions. That he just will state things as definitions, he'll stipulate things, but then use those as premises in or conclusions of arguments. He's fighting against a popular movement in late 60s, early 70s that came primarily from Australia with people like J.C.C. Smart and David Lewis and uh, Armstrong, I think David Armstrong, etc., where they were doing what they called identity theory. Every entity referenced 
in talk of one's conscious experience is precisely identified with some biochemical nervous system event. Parentheses in the brain, on parentheses. Nagel doesn't really like that very much. He says, Philosophers share the general human weakness for explanations of what is incomprehensible in terms suited for what is familiar and well understood. Note that he calls that a general human weakness. Another thing that I've been studying up on recently, because we're going to talk about it in the near future on the Dollar's philosophy, is philosophy of science. And in much philosophy of science literature, <laughs> what Nagel is calling a weakness is precisely what they think science is all about. That, we, that science is to provide explanations, yeah. and explanations are taking the unfamiliar and reconceptualizing and redescribing it in terms of the familiar. That's what it means to explain something. Yeah? You want to add something? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. It's, uh, I'm not, I, you're still doing the lead up. I guess I didn't, I mean, I read the beginning part, of course, but I, I there's certain parts where I'm like, Rah! okay, you need me to right just keep now, going? Like, uh, yeah. Okay. I think so. Nagel writes, without consciousness, the mind-body problem would be much less interesting. With consciousness, it seems hopeless. So he wants to set up that dichotomy. He says, you identity theorist types, you're just leaving it out. And if you leave it out, then you're not dealing with the real, what we now call, in Chalmers terms, the hard problem. And if you do take the hard problem seriously, everything's hopeless, give up. So, he stipulates that conscious experience is a widespread phenomenon. And then he adds, it occurs at many levels of animal life. Though we cannot be sure of its presence in simpler organisms, and it is very difficult to say what provides evidence of it. And, you know, I can't help but pause to say, ahem, at that point. So, he doesn't have any evidence... <laughs> But he wants that for free. Conscious experience widespread, and all kinds of animals, though not all animals, have it. Many kinds of animals have it. No doubt it occurs in countless forms totally unimaginable to us on other planets. Uh, so now we've got aliens in and Fermi Paradox solved and all that stuff. Episode 9. Okay, so what's his definition? What is conscious experience? We like definitions on this program. I like definitions. Conscious experience means <laughs> that there is something it is like to be that organism. The subjective character of experience. Fundamentally, an organism has conscious mental states if, and only if, there is something that it is like to be that organism, something it is like for the organism. This phrasing, this little meme, has become extremely popular and they, philosophers of mind, debate it to this day. I, as I understand it, this was the yeah. paper that introduced that phraseology, the what it is likeness. Right. And I just want to jump in really quick and he says later in a footnote, that what it is like, um, you know, it can be misleading. It does not mean what in our experience it resembles, but rather how is it for the subject himself. So he's trying to say it's not about, you know, you, you're not doing analogies or comparisons or whatever. It is being John Malkovich. Right. Yeah, I'm, we're going to get into that at some point soon. I have a couple things to say about that, too. But yes, good point. Because uh, one of the things that I hear 
from that phrase simpliciter is just, okay, well, you're requesting an analogy. What is it like? And since everything is like everything else in some respect or other, it's kind of vacuous. But he has a workaround for that that he tries, and we'll see how it works. Every yeah. subjective phenomenon, writes Nagel, is essentially connected with a single point of view. And it seems inevitable that an objective physical theory will abandon that point of view. And that's one of those sentences that when I read it, I stop for a moment and try to ask Nagel, do you think that you're providing a definition here, or do you think that you're making a substantive claim? And to this moment, I'm not really sure. All that he's licensed to do by this reader is state that as a definition, because you can always stipulate whatever definitions you want. But I think that he thinks he's making a claim about the world when he does that, which I don't really like. <laughs> yes. Um, it's funny because we definitely are like focusing on different things, aren't we? When we read this paper, at least so far. Are you going to come in all more the when we get to the... That you have issues with. Yeah. The bats? When we get to the bats. <laughs> well... <That's... laughs> um, well, I, I was thinking about it in terms of just... <sighs> probably just because I'm so biased in my headspace that like you know his sort of first off he has a huge problem and i think this is early on he has a big problem with reductionism right and um he's trying to set up a way to preserve the mind body problem it seems to me because as you were mentioning there are some people who are trying to um relate various neurological or physiological um you know phenomena with what people report you know they're experiencing or their subjective experience that kind of stuff I'm not I'm, i don't have like the tightest of grasps on this but um to me that just seems to be like that's kind of his primary sort of objective is he's preserving something in this that to me seemed like very clear was that he was like, no, I like this thing and I want to keep it. And here's my way of making it so that you can't do anything to it or whatever. Yeah. I know maybe I'm jumping around too much right now, but that seemed like the basic move of the whole thing and his enemy or his, you know, his foils or whatever it is, is reductionists, you know, and primarily probably, yeah, maybe particular he has in mind, uh, other philosophers, but also those philosophers likely seem to have in mind scientists, and he doesn't. I don't think he likes that move at all. Nope. Yeah, I think that he wants to build a little Alamo or whatever, where he's got his little protected special. Humans have this, and some other animals have this, and it's unique and special, and it's, you know, don't, science can't come in here and reduce it down to nothing. Right. Um, the, I don't know how far we're supposed to go with this, but my thinking is that his fatal mistake was trying to make an ar evolutionary argument to uphold the mind-body problem. You know, or in other words, demonstrate an explanatory gap between how traits function and their associated subjective experience or whatever. But that we'll get to, I guess, eventually. But that seemed to me like... So that was the parts... Those are the parts that I picked up on you know you're like stipulations and i'm like evolution you know so well yeah we're the next anyway section of the paper is the bats so we'll shift over to that because <laughs> that's how that's his little thought experiment or argument from analogy or from imagination that he's going to make if you grant his premise that conscious experience is widespread and occurs at many forms of animal life it comes from an essentially subjective point of view that objective or physical or scientific explanations cannot reach. 
So then he, what is, now yeah. we get to the bat part. And he makes another big, fat assumption. Do not glide over it too smoothly. I assume we all believe that bats have experience. And at least for this reader, nope, I don't, so you lose me at that phrase. But, after all, they are mammals, and there is no more doubt that they have experience than that mice or pigeons or whales have experience. Uh, what? Maybe there easily could be. He even admitted in the first page that it's a gradient, and at some point, down the scale of complexity, even he is going to stop yeah. attributing consciousness. So then why does he take drastically different mammals and say, well, clearly they all have consciousness? Eh, not necessarily. I have chosen bats. I, I thought because... at some point he actually walks that back later. But, I mean, in a, in a footnote, even. Probably. But anyway, keep going. <laughs> okay. Uh, I chose bats because if one travels too far down the phylogenetic tree, people gradually shed their faith that there is experience. Ding! By the way, they shed their what? Faith that there is experience. Again, jig is up. Nagel, this is faith. That's what the <laughs> critics are telling you. All this is is an article of faith. Okay. So he part of the reason he picks bats is that they're close enough to us that most people will grant that they probably have conscious experience. Even without the benefit of philosophical reflection, anyone who has spent some time in an enclosed space with an excited bat knows that it is to encounter a fundamentally alien form of life. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm I'm not sure why that's in italics, uh, or why anything flying would seem fundamentally alien. But oh, it's not that's... about the flying. I don't think it's about the radar, the sonar, the uh, bats closely related to us uh, have a sensory apparatus so different from ours that the problem I want to pose is especially vivid. Bats perceive the external yeah. I mean, world I, primarily I, I... by sonar or echolocation, detecting reflections from objects within range of rapid, subtly modulated, high-frequency shrieks. I think that's the part where it gets alien. I guess. But he, he walks that back later, too. Anyway. <laughs> he even mentions visually impaired people using noises to kind of get a sense for the room and stuff like that or why some you know it, it just seems to me like all right all right you know i don't know if it's all that alien i think what he's trying to do is set up something he's trying to really push certain things back to one side of the room so that he can draw a distinction so it, it's all to preserve this mind body this gap he's trying to create a gap between x and y you know or whatever it is that's what it seemed like to me. So it's like when I'm reading and I'm like, ah, you know, even the echolocation thing, I mean, maybe to a humanities professor, they're like, oh, it's alien to me or, or something. But I don't know. I would just think that, you know, I know I don't get into it too much because it's a short. Right. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, yeah. Well, it so, looks like it'll yeah. be more like, you know, a 45 minute or hour than a 20 minute or the way this is going. Okay. So, uh, no rush. The way this is going, I know. No rush. I have said that the essence oh. of the belief that bats have experience is that there is something it is like to be the bat. So, what he... I think the way that he wants to establish the gap, or the way that he wants to make a reductio ad absurdum or something about scientific or objective explanations of consciousness is that he's saying all right science can you do it for a bat can you tell me everything there is to know about being a bat from a third person objective point of view and since you can't if you can't then clearly you can't explain human beings either i guess the problem with this as somebody who's more into the game playing side of intellectual 
inquiry and all that kind of stuff is I'm not sure what game he wants me to play. Like, I'm like, so there's the whole evolution one. I'm like, oh, I can play that one. And then there's this whole, like, objective, subjective thing. And then I'm like, okay, where are the parameters there? Like, because a third person, object, it's like, ah. And then, you know, because he's thinking somehow Arbiter can be, a, I don't know. There's a lot of questions I have about that. And then there is the mind-body problem thing. And I, I half the time he talks about these things, and I even tried to look it up. I was like, are there any neurologists out there who've read this paper and been like, what? You know, or what? I, like, but I haven't been able to find too much of that. I don't know if it's just because while this is very prominent in the philosophy world, maybe it isn't as prominent outside of that, you know? Um, Hopefully. But again, I'm just not sure what game I, you know, like, and if you, you know, you've chosen the game that you know you're thinking about playing and you're like i ain't playing that game so it's like already like you know when he says i assume we all behave uh we all believe that bats have experience you're like nope i'm done <laughs> like, it's <laughs> like papers are floating down and you're already gone you know like door slams you know but like so i'm not sure what again i'll just say it i don't know what game he wants me to play so we like we just choose the game we're gonna play with this paper there's just a lot of different things happening here. Yeah, I guess maybe, probably, for sure, there's less agreement <laughs> within philosophy about the quote unquote rules of the game than there are in special sciences, at least, and maybe science mm -hmm. as a whole, but definitely within individual sciences. I think scientists tend to be more clear about and in agreement with the rules of the game than many philosophers. I think that Nagel breaks a lot of things that I consider good rules. An important one that we've been through a million times on this podcast is begging the question, and I think that he does that in every paragraph of this paper. That he, the... But it might have to do with his target. He's targeting identity theorists and physicalists. And I tend to lean toward this position we call eliminativism, where we don't believe in consciousness at all. And against the eliminativist, he begs the question often. Including the next thing I had marked, there is no reason to suppose that it is subjectively like anything we can experience or imagine. To be a bat. And what? So I think that's part of his game. To answer your question, what game is Nagel playing? He wants you to be playing this game that we could call conceivability. Yeah. That philosophers do that I think is a terrible game. Because all it can possibly tell you, if anything, is facts about human psychology, human language, human conceptual schemes, whatever. It can't tell you anything about the way the world is, or the way bats are, the way, you know, it can't tell you any of that. But he thinks you can reason from, I cannot imagine X to, therefore, not X. Which is a move that philosophers do often, and I think it breaks the rules. Okay. Well, and also, he's... The, there. This is, again, I'm not sure what game he wants to play, because... He talks himself about how we can't use our imaginations to get to the, you know, subjective character of experience or what, you know what I mean? So he himself is talking about if he's saying we can imagine this and then he's saying, but you can't imagine that. It's just like, well, what, what is it? Uh, that's why I just feel like this is just some, some kind of like preservation mechanism. Like he's like, I want this, yeah. you know, like, and I so you're right he's not that. keeping track of all the little the the various things that would come up that he you know that might be like objectionable or just not reasonable or whatever or inconsistent or what you know what i mean so it's like it just seems like a rough draft he was emotional he was the right <laughs> thing you know and then and then he put it out there and they're like well thomas nagel's a very important philosopher so we're just going to put it out there you know in the journal of whatever you know or who knows you know like i don't you know so but he had his memes, right? And so that helped. 
I mean, it's right there at the beginning, the you know, with the title. You know, yeah. it's very provocative. Mm-hmm. Like bats, what do bats have to do with anything? And like, what it's like to be, you know, and all that kind of crap. So, yeah. He also seems to admit the thing that you were just pointing to when he writes in a parenthetical. The problem is not confined to exotic cases, however, for it exists between one person and another. And I yeah. think that... So we've got in philosophy the problem the mind body problem supposedly right and that you know there's this gap between the mental and the physical and you can't explain one from the other way another famous philosophical problem they called the problem of other minds and it seems as yeah to me as if you take nagel's solidification of the mind body problem seriously you also get the problem of other minds and have to end up being a solipsist that you can only know about your own experience because I can't imagine what it's like to be a bat but I can't imagine what it's like to be a Ryan McKenna either no you can't <laughs> <laughs> but you could if you tried no um, yeah, our no, own experience over... provides the, the basic place. material for our imagination whose range is therefore limited and if I'm limited from understanding bats, perhaps it might be a matter of degree that to a lesser extent I'm limited from understanding my fellows, but it's still not total, and then I can only know about my own experience. Right. Yeah, it's, it's all or nothing, right? The thing that you were stressing earlier that we're coming back around to, I think, is this part. Insofar as I can imagine what it is like to be a bat, it tells me only what it would be like for me to behave as a bat behaves. But that's not the question. I want to know what it is like for a bat to be a bat. Yet if I try to imagine this, I cannot. Is, did you have something you wanted to say about that, or not that you already didn't? Well, I mean, again, that was like, um, I don't know if this makes sense or aligns well with what we're, what you just quoted, but like, on the one hand, he's talking about how I can't get, I can maybe only get partial experience with another human being, but then what it's like to be a bat as a bat, you know, that kind of thing. I certainly don't have access to that, but then he goes and he talks about how it's about, um, you know, types, not you know, individual experience or whatever. Like, so it's, it's all like, I'm not sure where to go often when I was reading this or what it is he wants me to be doing. That was the, the primary thing. So I then just glommed on to his primary thing that I thought that he was doing, which was trying to use evolution as a means to support himself in this mind body problem, kind of, uh, you know, to uphold it or whatever. And so that's that's why, because he kept going kind of bouncing all over the place. In one hand, he'd say something about like, you know, he'd talk about echolocation or whatever. And then in a footnote somewhere, he's like, yes, but I understand that there's blind people, blind human beings who use something sort of similar, but not to the extent, you know, like it's like, it's all this like, he'll say one thing and then retract it in another place. He'll say, no, I'm talking about types, but then he'll acknowledge the difference between two people and it's only partial. So it's not total. And so like, it's, that's kind of where... I just was like, all right, well, I don't, you know, I have to just pick something and then go there and and yeah. figure out what I can understand from what you're trying to say. And if what you're trying to say is this, then maybe, you know, um, I can get there from there. But you think that might yeah. be an artifact of the publishing process or the the process of being an academic that those are sort of responses to critics of drafts of the paper so then he just stuck them in footnotes but he yeah. is so dogmatic that he couldn't change anything i, I keep my point <laughs> but i know somebody told me about the blind people that can skateboard and the, the click their yeah so I'll, I'll put that in there but i'm not going to change any of my right mind. that was reviewer two who was just like those are responses yeah, to reviewer exactly. two. Yeah. yeah i mean that... well that to me though is like 
yeah, I don't know, but then it it that's something we're supposed to have like an internal struggle about what that then means for what you're trying to say earlier, you know. Rather than just making an acknowledgement, uh, but I kind of feel like that's not even important at this point. It's just that it was only important in so far as I wasn't sure where to go when trying to understand more or less what he was trying to say. Um, Because I've got two different areas. On the one hand, there's the, you know, this, this, you know, dividing by zero thing because he doesn't like reductionists. And and that helps him try and preserve mind-body. And on the other hand, he's also trying to use evolutionism or phylogenetics, but evolution, as a means to, you know, kind of talk about the almost genetic distance between consciousnesses or whatever the hell it is, you know? So it's like when it's really far apart, you know? Um, And so those were the only two places that I thought, you know, I could even have anything to say (laughs) because everything else was flip-flopping a lot, I thought. Quote, my point, however, is not that we can not know what it is like to be a bat. I am not raising that epistemological problem. My point is, rather, that even to form a conception of what it is like to be a bat, one must take up the bat's point of view. Coincidentally, ironically, that also is in a footnote. Who takes... The (laughs) sentence where they say, my point is, and puts it in a footnote. Nevertheless. So he's saying, his point is, it's a like I was trying to say earlier, I think, his point is about conception. It's a conceivability argument. My point is Mm -hmm. to form a conception of what it is like to be a bat, because for some reason that's important. And it's doable. But in order to do it, you must include... The bat's point of view. And then that pre- that's again a premise that he wants to stick into this argument. And physicalism, materialism, scientism, objective studies, necessarily leave out Total points cost. of view. So, then it just would follow immediately from those two premises, science can't explain consciousness. Because physicalism can't explain point of view... In order to know what it's like to be a bat, you have to use bat's point of view. Therefore, science can't explain what it's like to be a bat. And remember, from page one, we all agreed, it was stipulated, that there is something it's like to be a bat. And that's the argument, I think. That's his stab at an argument. It is something it's like to be a bat. In order to explain what it's like, you have to do subjective point of view of the bat. Physicalism can't explain subjectivity. Therefore, consciousness cannot be explained by physicalism. So that's the argument. And then the thought experiment that's supposed to be a sub-argument for that is try. (laughs) See if you can sit there and imagine what it's like to be a bat. You will fail. Then once you've failed, you'll believe me and you'll agree with me. That's... My version of Nagel's point in the bat paper. Does that make yeah, sense? So well, my thinking was, yeah, no, for sure. But all I want to do is then just engage with that. I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, so if that's the challenge, if that's the game, then let's play that, you know, or whatever. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Did you have any other stuff that you wanted to flesh out probably but I mean you don't have anything to say about that like that presentation or version of no I do I've got lots to say (laughs) no I've got lots to say I just trying to see if you wanted to keep going down some of your quotes or you know I wasn't sure how this was forming you remember when you used to record on voice meter it's got a little cassette. My cassette is yeah. spinning. And it says the word recording. 
but the time is going up since 13 minutes. And I don't know what that means. I don't know if this is being recorded on my end or not being recorded. But we can just press on and hope. And maybe I can extract it from Twitch or whatever. Who knows? Yeah, maybe that's what we'll have to do is extract it that way. Okay, Um, yeah, just go wherever you want. So my thinking was... All right. So he talks about subjective character of experience. And to me, that just seems like, okay, well... Oh, fuck. I'm like, ding dong. Hold on a second. We're professionals. Liam, it's bedtime. <laughs> um, apparently, we sound good. Our feed is a little glitchy. This is Rebecca talking. My wife. Yeah, hold on, buddy. Um, just taking a break, folks. <laughs> uh, let's see. It's glitchy because Harland refuses. To turn off his fan. I'm sure it's the fan's fault. The fan is off, um, man. Oh, you're smoother. You're smoother than me, she says. Maybe that's because it's coming through you and I'm just a guest or something? Probably. I'm highly expressive and in constant motion, seemingly unaware of the camera. More eye contact to engage the listener, please. <laughs> All right. Real well, time feedback. I have feedback. my fucking Word document up. Real-time feedback. I got your Word document right here. Uh, yeah, I that's fine. paper. I don't know. Jesus. All right. Okay. So, take the loaded... I'm supposed to make eye contact. Hello. Take the loaded subjective character experience thing and then drop it down to the plutonic character of form or something like that. And we'll talk about the circles again. Right? And... uh. We're going to then talk about putting points on the line that is the circle because we don't know the actual length of the circle, right? That's our problem. Um, And it's a perfect circle. So if we're going to, you know, figure out perhaps what the length of the the line of the circle is, then we we have to make it, we break it down. We would become reductionists, remember? And we make lots of points and we draw lots of little lines between them. And so, in theory, if we knew, say, the, the, like, the length of the perfect circle of whatever it is that we're talking about, um, then we could just divide, you know, that to know however many lines it is that we, you know, com- when we bring it all back together to make a circle, we'd know what that was or whatever. But to, if it's a perfect circle, then essentially the idea is, you know, we'd have an infinite number of little lines and points and then we'd be forced to divide by zero. But we can't do that because we're methodologically handicapped. Our reductionism can't get to the perfect circle. But we can describe a circle. Like, we don't have to go all the way to perfection. But I feel like that's the move he wants to make. But to me, that's just like this tiny, tiny last bit that it's like it doesn't even, like, we've done it. We, we went all the way and we got really close we're satisfied with that result and he seems to be unsatisfied with that. And that again is a trigger to me or the trap door comes down. It's like, Oh, you're preserving something because we've done something, you know, we've got neurology. It's not perfect. And yeah, there's a long way to go before we learn even more, you know, but it's like, we're still coming around to getting a sense for these things. Um, And so that anyway, was just when I was looking at that one footnote quote, which is comes after the whole, like, He's like, yeah, yeah, blind people also can do this shit. And then he, like, it's a big footnote on page 442. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, um, we can stop there and move on to other things. I want to talk about the evolution part before we end, though. I could be misunderstanding you. I could be misunderstanding Nagel. And most likely I am. But I don't think that what you said is what he's doing. I think that he wants to do something even worse. I don't think he says, you can go 99.9% of the way, but I'm going to preserve my little sliver. I think he's saying, you cannot even begin Uh your project. You can't make a bunch of lines or triangles or whatever and try to use that to figure out the diameter of a circle, even to approximate. Because 
Yeah, yeah. No, consciousness is totally separate and special, and you can't even. It's immeasurable. But aren't the Platonic forms also? You know, like to me, that's all that I was trying to say was that. But we get close. We get close to trying, getting something that works. You know, and and while it may not be some perfect conception of it, um, and that's kind of the move that I think he's making is that the mind is something that is almost just dis- uh, not even associated with the physical you know and like in a way the perfect circle isn't even associated with our little points and lines you know what i mean it's like it's it's like we're doing this thing over here it's like you can break it up into you know black and white is you can have your little thing that you're trying to do over here with your little points and lines and then there's the perfect circle, which you'll never achieve or <laughs> like that. And it's like, you can try and talk about neurons all you fucking want, but you'll never get the subjective, you know, character of experience, you know, like that kind of. That's, that was what it seemed like to me. Well, what um, about this quote? You know? Mm, if well, the subjective character of experience is fully comprehensible only from one point of view, which is what he thinks, then any shift to greater objectivity takes us further away from the phenomenon. So I feel like he's saying something so much stronger than through your attempts to mathematically approximate the diameter of this circle, you will never quite reach it. I think he's saying, even by attempting to measure it, you're getting further away from the right answer. Well, that's fine. And I think all I'm trying to say is, is like, take the loadedness of the subjective character of experience and take it down to something like as simple as a circle and what it is that's what one is trying to effectively do. And then it seems to me like it's just a way to kind of try and understand what seems to me the sort of I don't, know, I don't want to say ridiculousness, but the kind of like sort of extremeness that he's trying to perform to kind of push away things when it's like, what well, you know, we're, we're close. You know, we've, we've got things that help us understand this, you know, whatever subjective character experience or some plutonic character of forms or whatever it is. And he's just like, no, there is this huge gap between what you're doing and what, you know, you think you're doing, you know, that kind of thing. And that's where I feel like it's it's the same idea. It's just less loaded when I talk about circles than when I talk about like what it's like to be a bat and all the various complications and intricacies that go into that, you know? I don't know. I, I have my Word document up. I got to lower it so I can see your expression. <laughs> well, you're frozen, but oh, that's I... okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just not expressive because I was told by a reviewer that that that's just confuses it. the you're camera. You're just like this. You're like, <laughs> this is Harland on a daily basis. <laughs> I can't even look at you. <sighs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. But I can't move either. What do you want to talk about about evolution? Well, so he talks... He's obviously using um, this notion of subjective character of experience. And in particular, he's trying to use, you know, ever further out. He's trying to find the right exemplar or whatever, which is the bat. He talks about, well, bats are, you know, kind of closely related to, more closely related to primates than, say, you know, we are to, you know, hyenas or rats or something and so he's using that as a means to kind of like you know come on let, let's let's huddle up here and talk about yeah you know, hey so it's we got primates and no you know bats are kind of closely related to us in that sense you know we're we're not too far off in some ways so it's kind of it's, it's like what is the expression like uh far away so close you know it's that like they're, they're not too far away but they're far away enough you know and so he has that whole component that, you know, he's trying to build this little phylogenetic tree. He's trying to put you on a place as sort of the topology of the tree. And like, you're here and that's over here. And, you know, but it's not a, you know, not a dolphin. It's certainly not like a bacterium or whatever. So um, 
immediately he's trying to create some degree of relatedness. So it's like things you can relate to, things you cannot relate to. And he's trying to say, on the one hand, we can relate to these things because we can, apparently he's admitting, even though I don't know why he would say this, I mean, he's not saying it explicitly, but he's implying that he admits that there is something to the physicalist stuff. Because when he says, yeah, we're related to bats and we're close, more closely related, then there's some characters or traits, really, that are, you know, people are saying makes them more closely related to each other. And he's at least admitting the physicalist worldview or something into it in that respect so he can have his example. Um <clears throat> So he's using that. So the idea is that there is, you know, common descent, that there is a point in the past where our ancestors were one and the same or whatever, right? That's the idea. And um, from there, it's split into bats and then primates and all the various different lineages associated with that. So I'm unsure, again, about my grasp on this. But this is my take on the evolution thing when I see him using this as a means to talk about the, not just explanatory gap, gap, but just gaps in general between, you know, the mind body problem and his obvious issue with the identitarians or whatever. So this is me trying to play the game. Whatever subjective characters of experience are, and I, I don't know, is that sensations, emotions, redness of red, you know, those things, they're likely function is to preserve and inform the fu functional states of various other traits. If this is the case, then it does no good for subjective characters of experience or subjective experiences to be separated from those traits by some existential gap, like if they're informing them, you know? And so the subjective character of experience, again, whatever it is, it should so long as it's informing, you know, the other functionalities, it should be as tractable and as adjustable as any other form or function of an organism. Or he talks about aliens and robots, so embodied agent or whatever. If the form and function of a trait were to change and the subjective character of experience didn't, or vice versa, or both changed in different directions, it would be a real challenge for the organism bearing the mismatch. You may be a man who mistakes his wife for a hat. Or every time you throw a ball, you have the subjective experience of eating a strawberry. You know, To say subjective experiences have no constituency that can be shared or even really explained goes against the whole like phylogenetic exercise, I think. And it isn't to say that this has been accomplished or even should be. It's just that... You know, it, the idea that it's not po that it's impossible to figure, you know, what what a shared experience is versus, you know, what most organisms probably inherited as like salient feedbacks that accompany the relevant functions of their bodies. It just seems like that that to me is where it falls apart. And it's like, well, maybe we do whatever it is that's happening. Uh, you know, I know there's a discussion of phenomenal consciousness versus like, I know Keith Frankish is like, oh, consciousness is fine. Phenomenal consciousness is out. It's an illusion or whatever. And there's definitions associated, I suppose, with those things. But whatever it is that is salient to an organism in terms of what it's receiving, information, etc., how it goes about receiving that, to say that it's completely different in its offspring would be weird because then how is the offspring supposed to handle its environment? You know, if the parent was able to survive with functionalities that then got it to the point of reproduction in the first place, I don't know. It's just, that, that was my whole take on the whole trying to use evolutionary arguments to uphold the mind body problem against just it, it being a body problem. Uh, let me attempt to restate it, see if I understand your point. I hear you saying, if there are subjective experiences, and if subjective experiences are the product of an animal organism, then those subjective experiences 
should be slash have to be question mark evolutionarily advantageous or they wouldn't be there or they would be different that might be well too it just wouldn't be yeah i mean it would just be dis it would be a disadvantageous thing regardless of evolution if you just got something you know if you're you know if you're a beetle and you got the you know or i don't know where if you're some organism and you have some particular trait the sensory means upon which you use that trait if that is totally like you know different and doesn't help you or inform you how you use that trait whatever that is then you may not be using your your trait the way you could be the way it worked really well for your dad or whatever you know that kind of thing and so then if it's really off if we cannot relate to each other if we do not sh share some inheritance of whatever that nervous system component is that allows us to you know make decisions and and orient ourselves in such a way as to be able to achieve whatever it is we're trying to do with the various traits that we already have then i don't know what we would be able to accomplish as an organism and that's why i was thinking with like the is a visual uh gosia or something like that i can't remember what it's called like where the the man got like hit in the head it's the oliver sacks thing and he mistook his wife for a hat you know because his visual system was all screwed up now and so he wasn't able to like piece things together um in like the visual sense you know like if you were just born that way thinking a person was a hat and a hat was a person you'd be talking to hats and the people would be like what the hell is going on over here like why would that you know that wouldn't make sense if it was just shuffling the deck every time and i don't know what it's like to be you you know to me it's just like if you're going to use evolution as your means to try and use things to separate us then you're also it's going to hurt you because it's also the idea that we share things you know so why would it be any different to me inheriting some nervous system saliency or whatever functionalities associated with you know the activities of the maybe the, the hard parts of my body you know like the jaw and the arm and the you know what I mean? like flavor you know like you have a tongue and it has all these different sensory inputs, but it also has muscles and it does certain things and it moves food around in your mouth, but it also tastes things. And like, you're going to tell me that you can't know what it's like, but you're also going to tell me that it's, you know, you're going to use evolution to do it. I just don't think you can accomplish that. I don't see how Nagel is using evolution in his argument. I know that he referenced concept of phylogenetic trees briefly as a reason to explain to you why he chose bats or whatever but i don't think that evolution has any is playing a role in the core of his argument it, am i just missing it i think so um I think the core of his argument is that, you know, maybe I can get a partial sense of what it's like to be Harland or something like that. Uh, but I definitely can't get hardly any sense of what it's like to be a bat because, you know, we are, you know, unrelated, you know, to such a degree that we can't even fathom it because they use echolocation and sonar. They have all these different traits that they use to get around and his whole thing was if you don't if you only have partial right you don't get then anything what it's like to be the other person or something like that or the bat but if it's you know it's partial if it's a person right um and so my thinking was well how do you know like you you could just as well say well because we have these inheritances because we inherit you know teeth and we inherit you know you know we look like our parents it's the whole darwinism thing 
why should that be any different when it comes to uh, the way our nervous systems handle and deal with things? You know, like, and why is it that it is so hard to imagine what it's like to be then another person when you, in effect, are equipped with the same stuff? Like, that's all I was trying to say was if you're going to use evolution, then it seems like it can go the other direction as well against any kind of, you know, uh, what is it I'm trying to say? Degrees of similarity or difference or whatever that he seems to me like trying to set up. Nothing. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just you're trying like, to figure out how to di diplomatically say you're not getting, you don't get the point. You're not understanding what Nag was trying to do. I think. Yeah, okay. Well, that um, was my grasp on it, and it, it wasn't necessarily, you know, like I said at the beginning, it's it's my take on my, you know, I'm unsure of my grasp, but, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we're obviously past time, and we're sick of talking well, about listen. it. Uh, yeah. So, that's what it's like to be a bat. That's what it's like to be on a or live stream. That is what it's like. Um, should we stop? Yeah, should I, I'll stop my recording. Uh, Did you stop uh, the live stream or is it no, still going? No, I want to. I guess I don't even know. I don't have the thing up to see if anybody's watching us. If there is anybody watching us, thanks for stopping by. I uh, hope you do it again. If it worked... We'll do this more and eventually engage with some sort of chat if there is such a thing. Uh, so thanks for checking out the inaugural spin and uh, we'll be back for more.